Well, I'm adding my rainbow colors because it's tis the season of pride. And in, uh, in many churches, people will be celebrating Pride Sunday, knowing that the anniversary of the Stonewall riots is coming up this week. People, uh, you know, use that as an opportunity to celebrate the gains that have happened in the GLBT community in particular and the ways in which people continue to uh, work for equal rights and for uh, full respect and dignity for all of humanity. But today we're going to be doing Pride a little bit differently and next week as well. And I want to let you know that I'm proud of you and that you, I believe, will be proud of each other and have the message be out of some of our own shared experience. You know, I've been talking about raising up 70 leaders. And it's not just about having 70 people in assigned ministries within the church. It's really about equipping leaders and leaders that will serve, yes, in the church, but leaders who will serve in the community as well. Because if we are growing as disciples of Jesus Christ, we go out into the world. Isn't that what Jesus sent them to do? Uh, hello? Yes. Checking. Did Jesus ever say, establish the church and hold services? <laughs> Never. It's not in any of the Gospels. <laughs> he sent people into the world. So when we're talking about raising leaders, it is to serve in the community. And so some of you, as you hear that, you may not understand it. So as we're talking about pride today, we're going to be proud of some of the people in our congregation who already ex exercise leadership in the community in ways that may surprise you and I believe will touch you and hopefully inspire you in your own seeking of leadership. Now, even as we honor people today and look at it, are there things that each one of us could do to improve our leadership? Yes. Are there things I could do to improve my leadership? Yes. We are lifelong learners. Amen? We're not done. We are not finished works yet. But on the journey, God can use us, right? Some people are trying to get to the end of things. And by the time I've taken that class and when I've done this and when I've raised my children and yeah, da, 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 then I will. Oh, no. Jesus says, come follow me right now. Right? And to those fisher folk, he didn't say, I want you to come and do a little internship. <laughs> they did do an internship, but it wasn't like something they signed up for, right? They just started following and they learned, but Jesus kept sending them out in the midst of all that. They had tasks to do in the midst of their learning, amen? And so do we. We are on the journey. We're not waiting to get somewhere and then be promoted and go do it. So we are leaders now. Pastor Stephen, would you read us our first scripture that will remind us about the kind of leadership God calls us to? And this is from Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the one who brings glad tidings, announcing peace, bearing good news, announcing salvation, and saying, your God reigns. Amen. I'm going to ask Coach Kleba to come up. Chris Kleba, Coach Kleba. Coach. Coach. And I have the wireless mic with white on it that I'm going to give to Coach. She's already wearing one of our... Uh, sample badges that says she's, I'm in, one of 70. Right. Now, there's a number of things that I'm proud of Chris for. Many of you may not know that uh, Chris is one of our best behind the scenes volunteers. And actually standing up on the stage this morning is a huge deal. So just give her a round of applause. <laughs> huge deal. Because Chris likes to serve from behind the scenes. So uh, there's a couple of other people that help with this, but um, for many years, Chris was the one that made sure that I would have water for service. Now there's some other people she's trained by example. Uh, Chris likes to work with the Sunday school. Um, she comes up here and volunteers as she can many times on a Tuesday evening. And then the summer comes and she says, what days do you want me? And uh, we work on all the little projects like all my back filing. And uh, Chris loves to help me get all my files together and comes up here and works. But today I asked her if she would talk about something else that she's involved in that some of you may know if you're her friend on Facebook. And if you're not, friend her because she has very interesting posts. And that is that she works with Special Olympics. So Chris, can you tell us a little something about the organization and how you got involved? Um, I've been, is it on? Mm -hmm. I've been coaching Special Olympics for 11 years. Um, when I started, it wasn't because it was something I said, hey, you know, I want to go do something. 
They, somebody came to me and said, we don't have a coach, and we need a coach, and we can't have this if we don't have a coach. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't want to do it. But ever since that day, it has really changed my life. I started with volleyball, and now I coach basketball, tennis, swimming, track, um, bowling. Not yet. But every sport that I've added has made me open my eyes more and more to what these kids can do. It's really been a blessing in my life. And then you've also worked within your school with some kids about having some other kids help your Special Olympics, is that right? Yes, I have a peer, a peer partner class and we bring in gen ed kids and they work with the special ed kids and it's probably the best program I've ever been associated with at my school. Um, every kid I can get in there to help with the special needs kids, even if it's just for a day, even if they come try it and they don't want to stick with it, they see that these people are just like anybody else and that I'm not going to make fun of them and maybe I'm going to stand up for them and, and they're funny and they're happy all the time, just happy people. Would you say that's one of the best things about the, your involvement with it is working with those kids? And yes. I, I think that's the best thing is every teacher I can get down there, every other student, everybody that just gets a glimpse at one of these kids goes away, I know, and has a bigger heart and has more faith and just can see that it's okay to like these people and not be afraid. You know, I, I remember Chris telling us a story about, uh, uh, I think it was on Facebook, about one of her kids that was in track and field and everybody was cheering them on and the kids running and was really doing, she was about to run, win or something as I understand. But then as she came by the stands, everybody was applauding and then she started bowing, <laughs> taking Tom. But it was like, but it, there's, there's a beauty in that. So of course she didn't win the race, but she won the hearts of the people, right? Um, but she was acknowledging their encouragement and what a, what a neat kind of thing that's in there. Yeah, and we had one that uh, if, if a kid falls, and you don't teach these kids this, if somebody falls on the track, Everybody else in that race will stop and go to that kid and help them up. And you can't teach that. Those kids have a heart, and we learn from them. How would you say your spirituality has helped you in this ministry? Because it is a ministry. It's not inside the church, but this service that you do in the community. How has your, your faith, your spirituality helped you? Well, I think at first my spirituality grows. It just grows every time that I go. I, I mean, I had to have a little faith because personally, when they told me I was going to teach swimming, I thought, Are you got to be kidding. These people cannot swim. But just to get out there and work with them and watch them, just to have the faith of a tiny mustard seed, and it has grown tenfold working with these kids. So is that something you also then bring back from those kids to your own faith? Yes. That it's challenged you to grow and... Yes, every day I work with them. Um, I've always had trouble with my faith, but working with them has just helped it grow, and working with this church and working with you, Pastor, has, I can't even tell you where my faith has come from and where it's gone. We've seen it. We've seen you grow, and we've seen you in your service here, but we see you in your service in the community too. So I want to say... We're proud of you. We're proud of you, Chris. Yeah, give her a round. This is what leadership looks like. This is what leadership looks like. And it is working with populations that maybe somebody else doesn't want to work with. It is sharing your time, sharing your love, sharing your gifts, but also being willing and open to learning from the people that you're working with. Amen? Amen? Good for you. Good job. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. See, and Coach Kleba, you can call her Coach now if you want to. Um, Coach has brought good news to a whole group of people in her school and in her community and to the parents and families of those kids. And I know she takes them on trips and stuff. She goes out of town and all these competitions and things. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. And that's, that is having good news, bringing hope, bringing love, letting the love of God be seen through you. Amen? Amen. 
I asked Gene Goodwin if he'd come up too. This is another person who likes to stay in the back. In fact, he's probably in the hallway. Gene, it's your turn. It's Gene's turn. Did you get those words though? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of one who brings glad tidings, announcing peace. Think about that. Bearing good news, announcing salvation, and saying, God reigns. Did you think you could miss me and get out of it? No, no. <laughs> Teasing, teasing, teasing. So this is Gene Goodwin. You usually see him at the back of the church doing ushering and, and greeting, or maybe you meet him at the front door. You know, um, I met Gene back at MCC Dallas when it was still called MCC Dallas, and then it became Cathedral of Hope, and Gene was doing those same service ministries and helping in the ushering and whatnot, and he's always been there. Gene is one of those people that you see as a constant, Right? He's a foundation person, yep. and we're proud of you for that. You have some anchor. People can count on you. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? That's great. That, yeah. <laughs> so we're proud of you in that. I mean, you're there, and you have, you're reliable and trustworthy, and, and this sort of calming presence when people see you all the time coming in the door. Everything's good. Gene's here. <laughs> It'll be good. But I know that there's a lot more that Gene does in the community, a lot more. And I've asked him if he would share a little bit. So can you tell us about the organization you're involved in and what they do? Well, there's so many. But <laughs> one of the first ones that we're really going to talk about is uh, it was called Youth First Texas. And back when we started uh, CCGLA, Collin County Gay Lesbian Alliance, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, we wanted to bring that group to Collin County because we saw the need. Uh, there were so many homeless uh, youth, sofa surfers, you'd call them, and um, you just was aware of what was going on. So we started the group, uh, brought it to as an extension of Youth First Dallas, and now it's called Gala Youth. Um, so uh, in the early days, we had a lot of, we were having 18 to 21 youth every Sunday, and they were going through all the different issues you'd go through, plus the added of trying to come out, transgender or whatever that they're going through. With, there was a lot of bad behavior, uh, cutting, drugs, you know, uh, unprotected sex, and just stuff. And so we work through them and talk about it in our meetings every week, because we always meet every week. And uh, it brought a lot of kids uh, some peace and some acceptance um, and just awareness. And also they were connecting with others like them because they felt that they were the only one. And so, you know, Collin County is kind of conservative. <clears throat> so, you know, um, we worked through that, and over the years, the 10 years that I was heavily involved, um, I saw the transition from that behavior to now they're just wanting to connect and find others. I don't see the cutting like we used to or the bad stuff. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the, in the big picture it doesn't. And so that's really good that we've had that presence um, and outreach. And uh, in the last years, our age group, uh, it's 14 to 22, but the last three years, it seems like it's more 14 to 16. We even have some 13-year-olds that the parents are wanting to bring uh, because they're either transgender and they're going through those kind of issues and there's nowhere to reach out. And so we're there for them for that. And uh, recently we've um, got some people that will talk with the parents as well. So they've been going off to another room and the parents have a talk with somebody who knows all about these issues. Um, it, it may only be two people a week. It may be one. It may be five. But we're there. And uh, we also answer emails. So in, in 10 years, there have been a lot of changes with the mm -hmm. evolving of this. So one, there's more resources and there's more mm -hmm. general public acceptance. And, mm -hmm. and with the digital world, some of the older teens that you were serving mm -hmm. the, uh, and young adults now are able to find other resources and make other connections through online. Mm -hmm. But that younger population still needs yeah. to sometimes just go see, meet somebody else that's like them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, I brought a person one time that came to church a few times with us, and we went up to one of your meetings and right. met, and just it was important for him just to go a couple of times and mm -hmm. see that there was somebody else in his own age group that was like him. And then we found, mm -hmm. uh, through your group, found mm -hmm. that there was a group had, that had started in Denton. Yes. And we were able to connect him. So resourcing is good, too. Mm -hmm. So how have you specifically been involved with that group? Well, in the early years, you know, um, be, always being there, being dependable, and leading the meetings and then I was a facilitator well that's what we all are we have to go through training background checks but um, also did the quarterly 
leading of the me meetings for the adults, you know, and what we're going to be doing and up upcoming events and things. Um, so it was all that kind of involvement. And when other people were scheduled and they can't make it, I was always the fallback guy. Gene, can you make it? So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't been as involved as much the last year or so because I've taken on another role as a foster parent. Y'all know that. And so that's kind of pulled me away. But I'm still kind of in the background. If they really need me, they know they can call me, you know. Can you tell us a, um, uh, maybe a story or an incident, a situation where you saw that the existence of this group or the ministry that you were doing helped to positively impact someone's life or make a change for their life? Oh, absolutely, because, you know, we had kids that would talk about suicide and, and the bad behaviors, and you could see the faith and the hope that built, we built in them by being there and answering their questions honestly and some things you didn't really want to talk about. And we had to be very careful because we're not therapists. So we have people we can call if it really is getting heavy duty into that situation. But we also talked about safe sex, you know, and we'd hand out the materials. Um, you know, some of the kids were kind of young. It's like, no, you don't go play with this in the parking lot. You know, uh, you'd find rappers out there on the steps. It's like, no, no, no. Um, but, you know, that's just the funny part of it, you do education. But they appreciated it. And I didn't see any suicides. We had some attempts, but that was the goal is education and knowing that that we care for you we want you there talk to us about anything that's going on how um how has this affected you or how, how has it impacted your life doing this ministry well you know i grew up in the church in the methodist church and my parents were all involved and they always we were involved in some sort of ministry um and so when we left the church early on probably when i was 10 or 12 my parents divorced that kind of stuff um I didn't get back into church until MCC. Uh, was it 1980? That, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> That's dated myself. Anyhow, um, we all were real young. Colleen used, Colleen used to have a ponytail, or what do you call that? It was a tail, it was a, a tail. long, yeah, braided, <laughs> yeah. braided piece yeah. here. Yeah, that was her signature. Um, so it was just helping further the work and being a person of faith. Um, and it also, in my downtimes and the periods of depression I go through, I, how I dealt with that is I do what I do, you know, no matter how bad I might feel that day, I'm going to get up and I'm going to come to church, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to do what I do, and the end result, I always felt better for doing something, because you can't just shut the door, pull the covers up over your head and feel better, it don't work that way, for you, some of you it might, but it never did for me, um, so you just put that face on, whatever you need to do, and you go and do the Lord's work, because uh, I believe I was called to do more than just be self-centered and selfish, and I'm not. So you just keep, you so keep it's part going. of your understanding of your calling. That's right. great. Mm -hmm. That's great. How would you feel like that your faith, your spirituality has equipped you to work with these kids? <laughs> Some of those days were dark because of the issues the kids were going through and the parents throwing them out and just ugly things. Uh, I have to have faith and I have to believe that God wants more out of life than that. And we have to sh somehow show them the way. And I always end up talking about the church a little bit, although we're supposed to be low on the church talk. Uh, in the early days, it was really bad. I had kids that were from the Mormon faith and kids from the Jewish faith, and that was a constant fight. And it was like, okay, we're not going to talk about that here. That's not what we're here for. So it just helps me keep going forward to look and at the big picture. What have you learned from those kids for, you, for you, for your faith? How has it strengthened your faith? Or changed your faith, perhaps? <sighs> I don't know. I, I've kind of always had it. My parents instilled it in me. Um, so sometimes I don't recognize it, but it is faith. It's hope. It's uh, perseverance. No matter what happens to you, um, you will come through it. You just have to have a little faith and maybe pray about it and think. Have quiet time sometimes. Trust. Trust. It sounds like trust. Trust. Oh, absolutely. See, trusting God to help carry you through when you mm -hmm. can't do it yourself. Absolutely. Trust you to keep putting that one foot in front of a, mm -hmm. the next one. You don't want to. Right. <laughs> when you're too tired to, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just with a little help. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're proud of you. I'm proud of you. Thanks. I'm proud of you for 10 years with uh, CC, CCGLA. Mm -hmm. Which is now and Gala. As now Gala, Gala mm -hmm. Youth. And now you've also moved on to helping with the North Texas Pride and the development of North Texas Pride. Right. And so I'm proud of you for your service in the community. Mm -hmm. And this is leadership in the community. This is mm -hmm. taking your faith at church and, yes, serving at church. It's not an either or, but a both hand. Mm -hmm. And you do ministry at church, but then you take those same skills and gifts mm -hmm. and you're giving them back in the community mm -hmm. and you're sharing them 
with a population, a younger population, to inspire right. them. So even in those moments when you can't talk about your faith explicitly, because I know some of the Youth First used to have a lot of rules that you couldn't talk about religion, mm -hmm. but still uh, those kids are looking at you as mm -hmm. a living Bible mm -hmm. and seeing an example of God and seeing Jesus shine through in you. And I'm real proud, too, that uh, with the North Texas Pride event, this was our fourth year, and every year we're building our community in North Texas, and I was really proud that our church could be there and our pastors um, that really put a face to the, to the community for, for us in Collin County, but it's, a lot of people don't know about churches still. It's amazing. You think with the technology age, but people don't know. Um, and they, we had people that were stumbling, just out walking in McKinney and stumbled across and came in. And uh, it was really great that the church was there, and we've had people inquire and ask about it, and I'm hoping they'll show up. But, you know, it's our part of our ministry um, to be visible. We were the only church group at, at the Pride event, North mm -hmm. Texas Pride event, but it was very interesting because four pastors stopped by our booth and talked with us. So I have a feeling that there may be some more church booths there next year. Yeah. But it, yes, you're right. It was, it was a good witness, and everybody loved our little fans and everything, and mm -hmm. thank you for helping get us involved and making the connection. We're proud of you. Thank you. So thank you. Would you give him a round of applause? Thank him for his service. I'm just going to ask Gene to just stay here for another second and let him also be the face of our foster families in our church. Uh, we have uh, three foster families in this congregation, and we've seen quite a few children through those families in the last year, haven't we? And that's another whole ministry. And while Gene may be a newer foster uh, parent, but uh, with Trudy and Terry and with Amber and all the children that those families have served, uh, you are, again, exercising leadership and touching people's hearts. And again, I lift up that scripture, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And again, you are bringing, like Coach Kleba, you are bringing hope to kids. You are bringing love. You're announcing peace and possibility. So with all the kids you've worked with, both the kids at, at uh, Gala Youth and, and with your foster child and the other foster children in this congregation, you are bringing good news, and so we thank you for that. And not only are the individual foster parents, but you, church, I'm proud of you with regards to our foster families. I'm proud of you loving these kids and investing in these kids as each one comes. You know, uh, you could easily have the attitude of, we don't know how long this child will be here and a little standoffish, but you don't. You get right in there. And with some of the babies that have been here, and you're all hugging the babies and kissing on the babies and looking at the past, and then you have sadness that you have empathy with the foster parent when that child has moved on to another placement or to an adoption. You are able to support that foster parent. So thank you. I'm proud of you for loving in that way and making room for those children and supporting those parents. Pastor Stephen, we have another scripture, a gospel reading today that I want people to hear. And these beautiful words are from Matthew, um, verse, um, chapter 25. I assure you that when you have done it for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Noel, would you come forward please? You see Noel up here playing music, playing her ukulele, playing the happy drum, <laughs> playing different instruments. Some of you know her as Ukulady and her business, her store, Ukulady. Some of you know that with her ukulele playing that she has been to uh, Czechoslovakia and is going to be going to Spain. But she does some other things. She teaches lessons to kids and she does ukulele jams and as well as playing in the praise team here and used to sing in the, choir, in the choir when we had a choir. But she does something else with her ukulele. So would you tell us uh, the, the special project that you're doing and the organization you're working with? Yes, right now I'm working with the Scottish Rite Hospital for Children, which is an amazing organization. They, they take the kids that nobody else wants to work with that need um, serious surgeries or medical attention. And what really surprised me, the, the first class that I walked into to teach, or actually I was there and the kids were being brought in, um, I think there were about 10 of them, and nine out of the 10 were brought in in traction halos. 
and kind of wheelchair type things. And um, the majority of them had hand or arm deformities. One even was missing a limb. And I was like, how am I supposed to teach these kids? I was totally um, unprepared. <laughs> it's kind of a shock. And yet, and yet somehow God placed you in that place <laughs> for such a time to work with the least of these. Because maybe if you'd gone through and picked out kids to come learn the ukulele, you might not have picked those kids. Probably not. I would have been scared to. And I was scared after I met them at first. Uh, so what happened? Um, I, had, I, had to, I went home the first day and I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to, to help these kids? How am I going to do this? I was, I was like totally frustrated. And that was a time that, yes, I had to call on spirit and pray and say, give me ideas. And I had to come up with alternative ways to teach them. Um, we had good staff there that would also come in and help. And they're learning ukulele, too, now. And so we, we came up with alternative ways, different tunings, where one child was able to, to crook it in her, in her missing limb arm, and, but she could strum it with the other one. And it just made her beam. And this, this little girl also had an incredible voice, so she loved singing. And after we had our class, she said, I can do that. And she sat there and did the solo playing the ukulele for the rest of the kids. And so, and you tuned it to like an open chord so that she had the major chord of the song. Exactly. So she could play that, but then she yeah. got to sing. She so sang. she was making music yeah. and might have been passed over otherwise. Yes. And right. so I encouraged her grandmother who was there with her to keep her in some sort of music because it made her very happy. Wow. We had another little boy is about five, six he couldn't speak. He was in the halo thing, but he really wanted to play. So we put a little ukulele in his arms, and he just started banging away at strumming and the biggest grin I have ever seen in my life. And uh, since he didn't speak and he didn't have normal sign language, you know, I couldn't really tell what he was trying to tell me at the end of the class, and he just kept sticking his hand out at me. And, and uh, the director said, oh, he likes you, and so that's how he tells you that. He wants to shake your hand and wants you to come back. <laughs> so. Again, just bringing hope and possibility by, by being willing to even be there. The fact that you're willing to go and be there is such a gift. I think you were telling me, too, about one kid that did sort of percussion on the body of the ukulele. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she couldn't uh, really strum, but was just keeping beat which, as much as she could. This one, one little girl, um, the, all these kids with the, the traction halos were there for severe scoliosis, but they had other issues, too, which is why they were there and not at regular hospitals. So this little girl had... Um, with cleft, cleft hands, so she couldn't really use the fingers, but she would keep, keep beat. And it took her several sessions before she would start singing a little bit, but now she's into it. Okay. So how does it make you feel when you see these kids just start to beam? Or how does it make you feel when you're going, what on earth am I going to do? And then you have an <laughs> idea and you're able to help a child make music. It's, it's wonderful. It, it gives them a feeling uh, you know, of satisfaction of being able to do what, what regular kids can do, that they have that capability too. Uh, it's, it's just very, very joyful to go home and feel like you have accomplished something to bring joy to their lives. And I believe with Spirit Runners, you believe that music's healing. Absolutely. And with church, you yeah. believe that music's healing. So yeah. do you feel like you're bringing a, a different piece of healing to them in that setting? Yes, yes. Mainly just because it's something they can continue to do. They don't have to, to limit it there at the hospital. They can take it home and still, still do something to, to make their lives happier. And how would you say this has impacted your own faith journey? <laughs> you don't even know this piece of it. <laughs> Uh, several years ago, I had the opportunity to get funding to go back to college. And so I made an appointment and went and talked to the head of the music therapy department and was totally crushed. She told me I was too old to get back in that, that, that uh, area of work. <laughs> I went home, drove home in tears the whole time. Well, now, all of a sudden, you know, a few years later, God opens this door, and I'm doing my music therapy. I'm just not doing it their way. Amen. So. <laughs> Once again, I want to hear the power of that scripture, too, that I assure you that when you have done this for one of the least of these, your brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. And so here you are 
caring for these children that are in the hospital who have a number of, of limitations in their bodies, but also limitations of their access to things that would bring mm -hmm. them joy. And you're doing something that is creative and healing and giving. And I know it, it comes from your love of music and your love of God and your love of all of God's people. So thank you. Thank you for being a leader in the community. Thank you for giving of yourself and giving of music mm -hmm. to the least of these, to these children. Thank you. We're proud thank you. of you. Thank you. I hope you're hearing not simply just interviews. I hope you're hearing challenges of that the little ways in which you give make a difference. Are you hearing it? I mean, I could preach it and we could have all this other you know, like flowery words, but for you to have the living examples of people you know who are giving in different ways and making a difference in the world, doesn't that inspire you? Does it? Yeah. Encourage you to find the ways in which you can bring good news and which you can serve God's people where you find them? Yes? You know, we had a couple of other people uh, invited today, too, to share, and um, I asked a couple of them if they wouldn't mind not. Because we had an incident in the congregation that happened this week, too. So, in case some of you aren't aware, that Gail Dietz passed away this past Tuesday. Well, I asked for a picture in case you didn't remember who she was. I'm going to tear here. Gail was not always the easiest to deal with. Come on, be honest with me. Um, her appearance could be off-putting when she would wear three hats, right? We had four shirts and a jacket and three hats. And many of you would see me on a Sunday morning. I'd just be going by Gail going. Because we would have these talks on Tuesday that it's cold outside. She'd say, it's cold. I need these hats. It's cold. And I have to stand and wait for buses. And they'd say, yes, that's true. But it is not cold inside the church. So we would have these conversations on Tuesday and then come Sunday and then I'd be saying, take <laughs> but we had these ways um, kind of with each other. But some of you may not know that Gail would come early and put out the signs in the parking lot. She had her ministry. It was really important to her to have a ministry. Really important. And so putting out those signs every week and picking them up made her feel a part of the church and made her feel like feel her contribution, and that's important. <coughs> and we can be proud of someone for doing their job faithfully, regularly, the smallest of jobs, yes? That's right, yes. <coughs> if you ask Gail to do something, she would willingly do it. Sometimes she'd start to be a little bit eager and not finish all the instructions. <laughs> but she was willing to do a job, so when she was up here during the week, if we asked her to help with something, she would gladly help. And gladly do something that was within her capabilities. And we generally tried to ask her things that were within her capability. Tony, I'm proud of you for picking her up at the bus station for so long. It would take Gail two hours to get here to church, and two hours to get home. But she came every week, unless it was raining hard. And why would she not come when it was raining hard? Because there was an interval between bus changes that she'd have to stand outside, and there was no shelter there. Otherwise, she was here, and you all know that. She made a big effort to come to church. And you were her community. You were her family. This is the place she got hugs from some of you. This is the place she felt she belonged. This was her place of acceptance. So proud of you, Tony, for picking her up at the bus station and helping her be here. I want to say I'm proud of you, Cheryl. For all your this is just a little bit more raw for Cheryl and I because of all the doctor's appointments we went to with Gail. See, Gail was not a person who could go to the doctor by herself because she wouldn't remember what the doctor said to be able to tell anybody else or to follow up on her plan of action. She wouldn't remember it. It would get very confusing to her. When she would go to the doctor, she wouldn't remember her symptoms or how she was feeling to be able to tell the doctor. 
And so it was important that someone go with her. So Cheryl went with her to a number of appointments, as did I. But in the last several months, it's been Cheryl. And just last week. To sit at the doctors, the social workers, the psychiatrists, the counselors, to make sure that there was consistency in her plan. So I'm proud of you, Cheryl, for your faithfulness. Cheryl worked with Gail Tuesday afternoon, and it was on her way home from church that Gail died. So I ask you to have prayers for Cheryl, too, as well as um, Gail's family. That's hard. But we can be proud of that kind of leadership. I don't know of many churches that have members of the church or pastoral staff that go to doctor's appointments with their members. But I'm proud that we do <laughs> because it's part of the least of these. And Gail's not the only member of this church who has somebody go to the doctor's appointments with her because sometimes people need a third set of ears. We've had members of the church who were fearful about cancer who had a test coming up that they were going to hear the results of that test and they just needed somebody else to be with them. And we can do that. It's, it's not a hard thing to do. Or um, we've had that with several people, just needing someone else to be there. And Cheryl's done that with other people as well as with Gail. But I'm proud of you, Cheryl for your work with Gail and with others and for loving the least of these. And I'm proud of you, church, for the ways in which you welcomed Gail and made a place for her. A little over two years ago, Gail was about to become homeless. And she was so depressed and she had so isolated. And I believe she would have been dead two years ago had it not been for this church. And because we were able to intervene and help her, she was able to break out of that shell of isolation. She was able to avoid homelessness, move into a transitional house that was very challenging and difficult for her. But she learned some new social skills she was able to practice the social skills here. She was able to come on a Tuesday. Well, actually, when, when she was so feeling so awkward, she started coming like three times a week. And she would practice things here, practice how to talk to people, how to ask a question, um, make all of her phone calls here so that if she got stuck when trying to call Parkland Hospital, and if any of you have had to deal with Parkland Hospital, that can be a challenge. So to make Parkland calls when there was somebody else here who could help her was important very important, it was life-giving, and to uh, make that transition into another home. And the week that she died, this last week, she was moving into another home and making another transition, and little did we know she was making a transition to a, a different home <laughs> than any of us knew, yeah. and she made a transition all right. But I'm proud of you, church, for the ways in which you helped through the Benevolence Fund. We supported Gail for a year and a half with bus passes because there was no other way for her to get around and she didn't qualify for funding. But you helped, you helped her be able to get around by your giving to the Benevolence Fund and it made sure that she wasn't isolated and stuck. She could get to her counseling, she could get to her medical appointments, she could get to church because you gave and you cared. There were people from this church that helped her move and came with trucks and helped her move. There were people lined up this past week to help her move again. So thank you, church. I'm proud of you for the ways in which you make room for someone, the way in which you support someone who would have been seen by our society as the least of these, as the least of these. I've had several of you ask me if there was anything untoward in Gail's death, and I just want to assure you that there was not. It was an unfortunate accident. Um, some people have written me and asked me, was she pushed? Did somebody try to hit her? Was it an attempted mugging that went wrong? No. She was at the 7-Eleven. She was coming out of the 7-Eleven. She tripped, she fell, hit her head, and died. 
You never know, do you? There was a witness that saw her fall. She went unconscious and uh, never came to, and 30 minutes later, she was deceased. There was a detective. They have checked the videos from the 7-Eleven. So I just want to assure everyone, there was nothing that was an anti-trans or trans hate thing at all. This was uh, an unfortunate accident. But I'm also proud of you for having that worry for her. <laughs> Do you hear me? For wanting to ask the question and make sure it was investigated. I'm proud of you for that, for caring, instead of letting it go. And we can rest assured that there was nothing wrong and that the police did look into everything and that she was treated with full dignity. So thank you. I'm proud of you in that. I want you to give yourselves a hand for loving one another. Yeah. Thank you.